Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. This is the first webinar of uh, the 2023 webinar series of the Center for Global Mental Health Research at the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, some of you attended the 2022 webinar series, which is which hosted seven webinars last year. They are uploaded and they provide um, uh, an important overview of different tips, mechanisms, and process to apply to um, uh, some of the uh, calls for applications that NIMH puts forth, both for the training awards as well as for the research awards. So I would invite you to access those um, recordings that are now live. Today, we are kicking off the first episode or the first webinar of our 2023 series. And I am thrilled to uh, announce that this webinar has been co-organized by uh, NIMH and our colleagues from the Welcome Trust. And they will soon uh, be invited to come to the screen. The topic for today is finding the right treatment for the right people at the right time. Whereas in global mental health, we have a very important challenge ahead which is to provide access to care to individuals that are in need. It is equally important to ensure that they receive good quality of care. And part of that is ensuring that the services and the treatments we are provide have the highest likelihood of helping these uh, individuals and communities and to optimize the care we provide. And this is precisely one of the areas where a certification comes into place. I would like to invite uh, um, my colleague Usman Hamdani uh, from Local Trust to turn off his camera. Next slide, please. So today we have three speakers. As I mentioned, uh, Welcome Trust is the co-lead from of this webinar. Usman Hamdani, who is now on camera, is the research lead for the mental health translation team at Welcome Trust in England. We will also have Wesley Fortin from the foundation for the National Institutes of Health, and Arthur Calle from uh, the uh, University Federal de Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Uh, without further ado, I will turn over to Dr. Usman Hamdani. Usman, please take us in this beautiful journey of this webinar. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Leo, for uh, co-hosting this webinar with us, and uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking you all for your time, especially for Leo for helping us organize this. Now, you know, stratification, what do we mean by stratification in global mental health research? We all know that the mental health diagnostic categories are imperfect, they rely on subjective measures. And as a result, whenever we have a diagnostic category, there are a huge variation in the characteristics of people who are within the same diagnostic category. We need objective markers, that can help us classify these people into subgroups and so that we can intervene and provide right treatment to the right person to the right time. Now, these markers could be biological, psychological, social, digital, mechanistic, response, risk stratification, and so on and so forth. They could be genetic, uh, they can be biochemical, anything could be there. But this is an area of research in global mental health, which we think is of strategic importance to Welcome Trust and the NIMH, and hence this webinar. Uh, as part of our strategy on this specific promoting uh, stratification in global mental health research, this is actually third webinar that we are hosting. And when I'll be talking about uh, my talk uh, in, in the part of this webinar, I'll allude to the other webinars and where you can find it. So as a result, you will have a complete list of like how we are looking at stratification in global mental health research. Our two speakers today, Arthur Kai and Wesley Horton, are going to be talking about specific dimensions of stratification. Uh, Wesley is going to be talking about biomarkers, and Arthur is going to be talking about predictive algorithms and how they can help us stratify. So without a further ado, I'll let uh, pass it on to Dr. Wesley Horton, who will be talking about uh, the work of the foundation of NIH and biomarker validation and how is it relevant to global mental health research. So over to you, Wesley. All right, thank you so much for the invitation and for having the chance to speak here at this uh, this, this talk today. I'm really excited to walk through a little bit here around uh, regulatory engagement uh, as well as biomarker qualification and kind of what the foundation for the NIH is doing in this space. Uh, and uh, and how we move forward drug development tools uh, to full use 
Um, and I think very much relevant to the idea of uh, the, at the end of um, any of these projects that will be ongoing and tackling solutions for mental health, uh, we'll need to bring together the right minds and bring together the right tools that will then be successful and bring forward to patients uh, tools that will be usable, tools that will be uh, meaningful, and finally, uh, things that will uh, make a difference in people's individual lives. So I want to start off just kind of uh, giving you an overview of the goals of my presentation. I'll give you a quick introduction to what the Foundation for the NIH is doing uh, more generally, what areas we're working on in mental health specifically. Uh, I'll give, in, uh, give a little bit of an introduction around the definitions of what a biomarker is and a clinical outcome assessment, what qualification looks like and how to develop a context of use that can specifically lay out an evidentiary criteria for final use uh, of those tools. Uh, finally, I'll give a little bit about um, our letter of intent process with the FDA and how we work with the FDA to bring uh, biomarkers forward through a qualification process. So starting off, the foundation for the NIH is a 501c3. We were founded by Congress to support the mission of the National Institutes of Health, being a convening place for private sector and public sector partners to work together, collaborate, and advance biomedical discoveries and breakthroughs uh, for treatments uh, and patients. Um, we work through many different partnership models. Um, so I'm highlighting here some of our uh, major areas. One of these are uh, the Accelerated Medicines Partnership, which is usually uh, a one-to-one -one collaboration with the NIH and private sector partners in the FNIH to develop and advance a project uh, specifically in an area. This is very much focused on larger scale initiatives. Uh, and one of our, our uh, flagship programs that recently launched in the last two years is our Accelerated Medicines Partnership in Schizophrenia. Um, which is looking to define trajectories and develop algorithms in clinical high risk for psychosis. Um, I'll speak more uh, specifically today about the Biomarkers Consortium and what we have ongoing in this space. We have two projects that have relevance uh, in the mental health space. One is focused on inflammatory markers of major depressive disorder, where we're looking at developing a biosignature um, of NDD, uh, as well as Alzheimer's disease and the differences between those. Uh, another project that we have ongoing is a SV2A PET project focused on synaptic density. Uh, this is focused on Alzheimer's disease, but have a, has a buy-up portion uh, to look into schizophrenia as well. Um, the Biomarkers Consortium is really focused on uh, developing specific projects. It is more uh, developed with private sector partners as opposed to being a full partnership with the NIH. Um, and so a little bit different in its uh, scope, um, but definitely an area uh, of active work within the FNIH partnership models. So the Biomarkers Consortium is looking at developing meaningful measurements. We're looking to lead and create cross-sector efforts to validate and qualify these uh, biomarkers or other develop drug development tools to accelerate better decision making. And so that involves really engaging with regulators, engaging with drug developers um, to ensure that what we're developing has the biggest impact, that the validation that's developed uh, supports the final tool utility so we can get these over the finish line and used uh, by patients uh, for finding solutions. We've got a lot of tools that we've generated within our consortium, and we've been doing this for over 15 years. Uh, many therapeutics have been advanced by the tools that we've generated here, nine clinical tools currently being used in drug development, five FDA guidance documents supported by the work within the Biomarkers Consortium. And at this point, we have one clinical safety biomarker that's been qualified. Um, we've worked with the FDA on uh, developing the biomarker evidentiary criteria, which I'll talk a little bit more about today. We have many publications and many member organizations that join um, as part of our steering committees within our consortium. One thing I will note is our work within autism, which developed uh, two LOIs that have been accepted into the biomarker qualification program. Um, one is on eye tracking uh, for sociocommunicative deficits, and one um, is on uh, an EEG marker in these areas, uh, looking at uh, developing and advancing those as stratification tools. Um, those were the two first uh, psychiatric biomarkers accepted into the biomarker qualification program. Uh, this is giving you an idea of how it's governed. Um, so benefits of projects being within our consortium involve uh, the ability to work within our steering committees, which have uh, very 
uh, focused uh, uh, efforts within the specific disease area um, and uh, a lot of expertise in driving this forward. Uh, embedded throughout our programs are engagement from the NIH as well as the FDA um, to really ensure that what we develop here has long-term utility um, in being uh, impactful for drug development. Uh, and finding therapies. One of the piece here is that we're not just interested in the drug development aspect of this. One aspect of it is in having the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services on our executive committee um, is to get feedback on payer perspectives around these tools. Um, as we all know that one of the biggest hurdles will be um, not just making sure these tools work, but making sure that, uh, that patients and individuals have access to these tools in the end um, that could then find them and match them to the right therapies. So I want to start at a high level, just giving a quick introduction to some of the definitions. We find it really important to kind of be very specific in the language that we use um, so that we can make sure everyone is on the same page. So I want to go over uh, a few definitions here around a biomarker, a clinical outcome assessment, and a surrogate endpoint. So biomarker is really looking at a objective measure of a process, whether that be biological, uh, invasive, pathogenic, uh, or a response to an exposure, um, and uh, to a, uh, or to a, a therapeutic intervention. A clinical outcome assessment is reflecting how a patient feels, functions, um, or survives. And a surrogate endpoint is used in clinical trials as a substitute for a direct measure of how a patient. Um, how a patient feels functions of surprise. So is a, it is a surrogate of that major point. Um, it's, an, it's important to use these uh, tools um, in assessing kind of safety and efficacy of drug development, but they differ very significantly. So you want to be careful uh, not to equivocate some of these different terms and make sure that whatever you're developing specifically fits into one of these categories so that you can get the right engagement um, from regulatory, uh, regulatory uh, and drug developers. So there are kind of three different ways to integrate biomarkers or clinical outcome assessment into drug development, uh, ways to advance these through uh, what we consider like final qualification. Um, so there's uh, each drug company will be submitting, you know, an IND for their specific drug development pathway, um, and they will need to support that with what evidence they have specifically on what biomarkers they would include in that. And so a high threshold of evidence would need to be provided to ensure that what they're using will be able to detect a signal and be uh, helpful for advancing their therapeutic. Another pathway that's more open uh, is to go through the biomarker qualification program within uh, the FDA. So it's a formal pathway, um, which I'll get to in a bit, but it allows for open collaboration with the FDA um, and, um, and drug developers and private sector uh, to really engage on what the evidence is and stake a claim on what we would like to do in this space and, uh, and make sure that whatever that is, is really clear and everyone feels uh, strongly that they can uh, prove and show that it works in that specific way. There's another way to, to getting something qualified, which is scientific community consensus. So over the years, uh, a, 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 a bolus of information is collected. Uh, information is, is kind of categorized uh, in a larger consensus sense, uh, and the community can come to a consensus on what is a qualified biomarker. And so there are a lot of examples uh, where we didn't go through a formal process to get something qualified, um, but it does in the end uh, show that consensus shows that this is working. So why do we want to develop biomarkers? Um, so one of the important parts, and I think was mentioned earlier, is around uh, improving diagnosis. Um, uh, as we know, there are challenges with the current diagnostic categories uh, in being able to understand what they uh, uh, truly mean and be able to subtype individuals into specific uh, ways that are outside of the current paradigms of uh, diagnostic codes. Um, so we want to find different ways of, of understanding and detecting these earlier uh, and to find more effective treatments by doing so. Another aspect of this is better monitoring of disease, so being able to uh, help clinicians plan accordingly um, and understand when things are progressing or when things are expected to progress. Another aspect is personalized medicine, being able to identify specific subgroups that might respond to certain uh, treatments differently. Uh, and more efficient clinical trials. It's a burden to be within a clinical trial, and uh, it's important um, that we show the likely benefit of a particular treatment and show that in a cost-effective and efficient way uh, that, that releases burden from patients. Um, early interventions are increasingly important um, as we understand biological processes start earlier than we actually detect symptoms. Uh, and improvement to drug development, knowing whether a drug is safe, knowing whether it's efficacious is really important. And these are uh, helpful uh, indicators of how this would actually work. 
So in the end, what we would like is qualified biomarkers. Uh, and to do so, uh, we would want to have um, a qualified biomarker go through uh, the qualification progress process. And what this allows for is evaluation of the usefulness of a biomarker for a specific context of use in drug development, ensuring that that would be useful for patient care, providing uh, an endorsement of that tool to support decision making um, for, uh, for, for individuals. One thing to, to note is while the short term, uh, it is important for drug development, it's, it, it is uh, usually in this space that some of the more novel techniques would take place that would then enable uh, more and better uh, therapeutics and, uh, and diagnostics in the future. Biomarker qualification program kind of has a few steps here just to give you an idea of how this works with the FDA. There's a letter of intent um, that's submitted that proposes the context of use and its use within drug development, a qualification plan, which generates the necessary supported data to qualify a biomarker, and a full qualification package, which will allow you to support your qualification with that proposed uh, context of use with all the data that's been generated, uh, generated so far. In the end, the FDA would then uh, provide a qualification recommendation on whether this is, is uh, qualified for that proposed context of use based on a review of that entire package. There are kind of multiple different uh, steps to conducting a qualification of a biomarker, understanding what the need statement is, what the unmet uh, medical need is, what the drug development need is, or what the knowledge gap is. Um, defining specifically what your biomarker is. Is it going to be a stratification biomarker for inclusion in a clinical trial? Um, will it be detecting a pharmacodynamic response? Um, will it be uh, detecting, um, uh, will it be, uh, uh, um, what question is that specifically addressing? Um, so that's the aspect of drug development, but to think about it also to the patients, what is the benefit and risk ratio here? Um, does it show improved sensitivity, selectivity? Um, does it have a mechanism that is uh, novel um, and, and a new novel area for to be understood that would be helpful for understanding a drug's effect? And then the risk, what are the consequences of a false positive or consequences of a false negative? And once you've developed this kind of frame set, you then work within your, your, your specific qualification tool to say, what are the evidence that I need to show the relationship between this biomarker and the clinical outcome? What rationale is there on the use of this biomarker? What type of data study design would support this most well? Do I need to perform a, a study that's prospective? Do I need to have some sort of therapeutic intervention that would then detect a change in this uh, specific um, uh, measure? and what independent data sets are available for use within a qualification. And so these are all kind of a, a basis of, uh, of, of thinking through um, how you would show the evidence that would uh, support your final utility of this tool. Uh, another piece here is uh, really statistical methods as we think about stratification uh, and the fact that this will be a multimodal approach to think through what statistical methods you are doing to train and then test your models um, are also really important to show detailed um, underlying um, you know, uh, um, uh, algorithm development and process to that to be very clear about what the underlying underpinnings of that model might be. So I want to talk a little bit, what might be helpful around how to develop a context of use um, and how to know when you want to go through a qualification process. And so when you want to go through a qualification process, you want to look at what the feasibility of this biomarker is for, the, for your specific context of use. Um, and so you want to look at the data supporting the causal connections of this disease, as well as the clinical outcomes, um, to, to really ensure that this is a, a prepared um, aspect and carefully uh, select your context of use. Um, so consider that unmet need, what would resolve a gap that currently exists. Um, keep that context of use very focused and narrow. It might feel like you want to develop a context of use that would be for all, all diseases, but you might wanna use a model disease area that is of known interest um, to first subtype in that and then show later on uh, some, some gain in other areas as well. You want to understand uh, industry perspectives, so we want to find the tools that can actually open up uh, further uh, therapeutic interventions. And so, getting that uh, insight on how a drug, uh, how a biomarker would be used in a drug development or clinical trial context, um, collaborating and understanding what that utility would be and what um, what they're looking for in order to make this usable, and then um, ask if the context of use is feasible to the evidence to date. Um, and what I'll talk about next is a little bit on how to develop and select your context of use using the best criteria. 
So this criteria was developed by the NIH and the FDA on biomarker and endpoints and other tools, uh, classification for a range of different biomarker types. Um, so listed here are a few different examples of different biomarkers um, that are of interest. And um, these are uh, kind of some of the categories that you will need to think through, whether this will be a susceptibility or risk biomarker, whether this will be diagnostic, prognostic, monitoring, whether this is a predictive biomarker, pharmacodynamic, pharmacodynamic response biomarker, um, which also includes some surrogate endpoints, as well as safety biomarkers. Uh, important to read through some of the uh, descriptions of these, uh, considering what tool you're developing, and kind of mapping on to these definitions to see which is the most applicable to how you would like to develop your specific tool. So biomarker approach uh, will involve a validation effort that will be kind of testing out what these biomarkers would do, looking at what measurements you're going to be utilizing, uh, getting an understanding of the analytical validation. How well does it detect or do what you think it's, it's doing? Um, how, what kind of parameters like test retest do you need to make sure um, that specific tool is, is working in a way that can be usable uh, and trusted? Uh, and then looking through what your uh, clinical validation looks like. What are the outcomes of interest? If you have a gold standard, that's that's amazing. If you don't have a gold standard, um, how are you going to anchor to known clinical measurements, measurements to show that this does have some internal validity around the specific measure you're targeting? Um, and there's also, uh, this comes from the uh, evidentiary framework guidance um, that the FDA issued. Uh, it's a great uh, resource to dig into these. Uh, again, so just to sum up some of these ideas is to evaluate that unmet need, define that context of use using that best criteria. You want to engage with an industry and private sector interest, ensuring that you also uh, detect what is meaningful to patients uh, and working with nonprofits and patient advocacy groups to, to define that better. You want to conduct that rigorous analytical and clinical validation to ensure it's reliable and has clinical relevance. And uh, importantly, for any effort um, that would involve uh, uh, the FDA or involve regulators is to ensure that you foster public-private sector uh, partnerships so that collaborations are more useful for everyone, that the data will be usable um, by the broader community, and that what successes you have can be carried forward. Um, there's also opportunities for early engagement. So you have an idea, uh, you have a biomarker, you have some ideas of how you would like to use this. There's always pre-LOI submission meetings that can be organized, organized through the Critical Path Institute um, or within our biomarkers consortium that can then assist with bringing forward a qualification process and increase the likelihood of acceptance of that biomarker. I do want to highlight one quick initiative that we are supporting and have uh, the fantastic uh, uh, support of many private sector industry, uh, private sector, both nonprofit and industry. We're happy to have the Wellcome Trust as well as the NIMH really leading the way on this partnership around HAMP schizophrenia. Uh, what is listed here are kind of the ways that this project will enable um, a, an advancement within the new kind of area that's uh, a diagnostic area of clinical high risk for psychosis looking at deep phenotyping from different modalities, looking at uh, what clinical outcome measures would then be most helpful uh, and, and uh, indicative of changes or predicting changes over time, and then defining what you have as clinical endpoints. In this case, conversion to psychosis is, would be kind of a primary clinical endpoint that you're very interested in, um, but then defining out what those trajectories are, whether that someone is remission, remi in remission to the CHR state or not converting or non-remission. And so being able to subtype and stratify individuals into these categories would then enable uh, different types of drug development outputs, whether that be clinical outcome assessments, multimodal biomarker signatures, or as I mentioned, future endpoints that could be useful uh, in drug development. Another piece of this is standardization, um, being able to do large initiatives like the ones uh, that many are doing in the um, uh, with Welcome Trust and with the NIMH allow us to standardize against multiple different sites uh, and make sure those measurements are as standard across, as well as uh, ensuring uh, that uh, when you include an international component that you take into consideration the different cultural differences that may be driving or changes uh, that may be uh, different depending on those contexts uh, that could be driving or changing those biomarker signatures. Um, that is all I have to present. Thank you so much for your time and, and happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I think I'm going to pass it perhaps now um, over to Arthur Kaye. Hi, thanks. Uh, 
Dr. Horton. Good morning, everyone. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a specific project uh, we call the IDEA. It's identifying depression early in adolescence. And I think um, it gathers some of the things Dr. Harden is was speaking about uh, stratification in empathesis. Um, I'm not going to talk about the process, but more about what we have done in this project, which was funded by both the NIH and the um, the Wellcome Trust. So I want to begin uh, discussing why do we want to predict things in the first place? And I think. Two uh, words come um, beforehand. The first one is we want to predict relevant outcomes uh, in medicine and in mental health, and we want to predict outcomes that will change uh, what we will do next and uh, change the prognosis. For instance, if you have a sunny day, you can bring sunglasses, otherwise you, uh, you would bring an umbrella. Uh, that's a very simple concept, but I think it uh, translates to um, what we um, the idea of how how can we prevent outcomes better right so we have three uh, ways uh, of targeting prevention we can do universal prevention when we uh, target everyone uh, in our uh, intervention we have selective and indicated in the promotion of health and in the case of depression we understand from past uh, randomized clinical trials that um, the universal stretches were not effective, and it has been recommended that we shouldn't pursue uh, for instance-based prevention programs uh, to those that are at high uh, risk. Um, so we have one is indicated, so those that have minimal but detectable signs of symptoms that foreshadow a, a future mental disorder. I think this has been the main approach, for instance, for schizophrenia and uh, high-risk uh, individuals that have uh, subthreshold symptoms. Or we can use uh, predictive models to uh, identify those who are at risk, uh, even when they don't have any symptoms. Um, the definition of risk is uh, very hard uh, in mental health, as you know, how to identify the needle uh, in the hay. Uh, in the case of depression and many other mental disorders, I think the most um, relevant and used uh, marker of risk is family history. But there's a lot of limitations with that. The first is that we are only limited to those individuals that have uh, a family history in the first place. And the second, is that we know that family risk gives us very low uh, relative risks in general, right? As well, two, three to five, maybe in the case uh, of depression. Why did we choose depression? So uh, talking about a relevant, relevant outcome. So we know that depression is uh, responsible for most of the disability adjusted life years. Uh, so the, the years lost to disability. Uh, throughout the lifetime among mental disorders. Uh, we understand that uh, it's a very prevalent condition that begins very early in life. Uh, and that's why we chose to tackle depression in adolescence in the IDEA project. And uh, we know that most of these delis are lost in low and middle income countries. Uh, and that's another discussion that we're gonna have uh, afterwards, that most uh, most of the predictive models that we have are set, developed, and validated in high-income countries. Um, we we and we have these examples right from other areas of medicine. Let's take cardiovascular uh, disease, for instance. This is the Framingham risk score, in in which you don't consider just one risk factor at a time, but you can combine those risk factors to uh, compose a dimensional risk score. And a dimensional risk score has been one of the ways that in cardiovascular disease, we could set trials to understand, for instance, that um, uh, high uh, treatment of hypertension or dyslipidemia only works and it's only cost-effective and uh, cost-benefit, a positive cost-benefit ratio in very high-risk individuals. So I think, uh, so we thought that this was a model that we could pursue in mental health as well. 
uh, and to take then a dimensional approach, approach instead of a categorical uh, approach. So um, in the development of a risk score for depression, we went to uh, cohorts. This is a Brazilian cohort that we have um, uh, that already had data, right, collected from birth to uh, early adulthood. And we used uh, available data both in the development here in Brazil, but also in um, uh, other cohorts around the world to validate uh, this data. So I think this is one useful message for those that are wanting to uh, develop predict predictive models that we, we have uh, lots of data uh, that are available in different countries for us to propose analysis, uh, prospective analysis that could uh, deliver um, uh, effective predictive modeling models. So we selected uh, predictors. Uh, uh, those predictors include uh, biological sex, ethnicity, maltreatment, uh, school failure, uh, social isolation, uh, the relationship between parents uh, and of the child with their parents, uh, running away from home and fight. So those are all uh, predictors, and this is on purpose, predictors that are easily collectible. They're a source of demographical um, um, and cheap and easy to collect, and that we could collect with the, with the adolescent himself or herself, for instance, in schools, because we wanted this um, uh, score to be replicable uh, across uh, low and middle income countries, settings with low resources, and because we didn't uh, have uh, lots of evidence to support other kinds of um, predictors. And what we learned from by looking at the, the performance of each of those isolated predictors is that the score, the idea risk score that combined all of those together um, was better than using each of those uh, alone. Um, of, uh, which validated our, our intention to use a to that multi-variable um, model. Of course, uh, we have to understand that sometimes, uh, so prediction is always uh, uncertainty. So we have, uh, uh, we have a prediction that uh, many times is going to work uh, and many times is not going to work. So there's a lot of implications of that. Uh, and ethical implications uh, to discuss with the patients, for instance, uh, even when we predict depression with all, uh, high certainty, it might not happen and the implications of that. Uh, but um, so we, we published this first um, uh, risk score uh, generated in Brazil with an area under the curve of 0.78. This is similar to what we have, for instance, with the Framingham and other scores uh, in general medicine and in mental health. But uh, one of the challenges that we have in this field is that we don't have, we, we, it's very rare that we have valid external replication. Uh, in child and adolescent mental health, for instance, only 5% of the proposed models have been validated elsewhere. And we have overfeeding, um, uh, so replication, uh, replication and replication is like in real estate, we have location in prediction, prediction model, we, we must do external replication for us to be confident that we can apply those, uh, those models outside our original study. So what we have been uh, doing uh, afterwards was after we developed in Brazil, we went to uh, several other cohorts that, uh, around the world and applied the same model uh, without any adjustments to uh, new unseen data in the United Kingdom, uh, New Zealand, Nepal, Nigeria, the United States, and the second cohort, uh, independent cohort in Brazil. Uh, sometimes we didn't have the, the same predictors available. So you can see that we, we went from 11 predictors uh, in the original sample to seven to 10 in the different cohorts. So we, read, we had to, of course, run the model again, and this uh, um, generated loss of performance. But uh, one thing that we, we, find, we found very interesting is that we could um, replicate, the, the model was significantly better than chance in all the settings that we tested uh, across uh, 
seven, five continents, seven samples. So we were very impressed by how we lost performance, but still being uh, beating chance, uh, even when we developed the model in Brazil in a specific, very specific uh, context. Um, so what we wanted to do next was to use the score to identify those at high and low risk and gain insights uh, about biomarkers uh, uh, using this separation between low and high risk. So we wanted to examine these individuals and understand more about them. So uh, we began with one movie, the Back to the Future, when we went to the cohorts and looked at the data collected many years ago to predict an outcome. Um, uh, years later, uh, but then we wanted to change to uh, Avatar movie and to using this score, collecting data uh, 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 of high uh, and low risk individuals in Brazil. So we went to schools, uh, we surveyed uh, more than 7,000 uh, adolescents at those schools using the variables from the score and then separated the groups between um, high risk for depression, low risk for depression, and those that already had uh, depression uh, in this school. So we went, so we compared uh, uh, the, the probabilities calculated for depression. So this is using data adolescents uh, with 15 years of age, predicting depression three years later, right? Uh, we saw that uh, of course, females had a high risk for depression, and we know that depression is uh, more uh, frequent uh, among girls uh, in, in, during adolescence. Uh, but the density of the, the predictions were similar, although in, in, in Pelotas they were um, in Porto Alegre, the new sample, uh, they were higher because we had uh, a different mixed uh, case mix in this uh, new sample. The frequency of uh, those predictors were similar across uh, as well, but we have we had more uh, um, more frequent um, pre presence of predictors in the new sample, and the structure uh, also we compared the structure between this is a network analysis comparing the structure between the predictors were, was also similar between uh, the samples. So if you look uh, in the x-axis, you have the PHQ the the indices for depression, this, these are the low risk individuals. They had low uh, symptoms of depression and low probability as calculated by the score. You have the high risk group, those that have low scores of depression, but already had a, a high risk of depression at baseline and uh, those that were, were already uh, depressed. And then with these three groups, um, we, uh, we did a very thorough clinical assessments. We collected blood samples with uh, uh, genome-wide gene expressions, uh, cytokines and other of, um, inflammatory markers. We had saliva samples and new imaging, both functional and uh, structural. Um, so those, uh, we, there's a lot of uh, things in, in this. So the, the high, low risk group and high risk group was similar in terms of clinical uh, issues. For instance, the CDRS, which is uh, uh, an MFQ or two scales uh, of depression, irritability, uh, trauma. They had more trauma, of course. Um, they are, their IQ was similar. Um, and now what we're going to do, what, what we're doing is to analyze those groups in terms of their brain features, both structural and, and, um, and functional, their inflammatory markers as well, the idea flame as we call it. Uh, we are using chatbots to collect data, uh, real uh, uh, time data, uh, daily by uh, daily basis and compare some expressions of text between those groups. The chrono idea, we were measuring uh, how they sleep and how much they move. Um, um, and we have now, we're now finishing the third wave of data collection. So the regional score was predicting depression in three years. We, we reached that now. And uh, to, to our surprise or, uh, I don't know, happiness as well. 
this is an analysis of how many of those at high risk converted to depression uh, three years later in the low risk and the score uh, uh, work that we have uh, a risk ratio of around four uh, between those groups uh, defined at the baseline. So this uh, is our website, uh, which we're developing for further information and some interactive data. Uh, this was our financial support, uh, some uh, national and international uh, institutions, but it's all public funding. These are some pictures of the team uh, meetings during these years. And uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and before I actually go with my talk, uh, I would like to thank Wesley and Arthur both. Uh, and the purpose of these two talks were to actually introduce to the, um, the audience by examples and actually the details uh, of what do we mean by stratification. And Wesley very elaborately pointed out like what are the various stages for biomarker validation. We know that there are so many studies going on in mental health research where they, we are working on many different bio, biomarkers, but we know that they haven't actually made it to the clinical settings as yet. So the purpose of this talk by Wesley was to actually help you imagine the process and know the resources where you can go. Similarly, the talk that has been presented by Dr. Arthur Kai actually is a very nice talk in a sense that it actually tells you how, so thank you, Arthur. Uh, moving on to my talk, I'll be sharing my screen. And the unique part about this webinar is that we're not just going to be talking about a subject, but there is a funding opportunity that Welcome Trust is leading and it's open. So you can actually look at these ideas, look at your work, and you can put together an application and get funded and help us take this validation of markers and global mental health forward. So I will now share my screen and I'll take you to the webinar. So this webinar was recorded by us a week ago and Professor uh, Pim Pfeiffers and Dr. Mark Vinomran from WHO were the panelists along with the uh, info, uh, along with our Welcome Trust team. Uh, I'll be just presenting the part that is about the funding call so that you can know what are we looking for in our funding call and put together the applications. The due date is on the 6th of June. Um, so it's about in a month's time. And uh, you're more than happy to visit Welcome Trust website, look at the full webinar and where uh, Dr. Pim Kaifers and Mark Van Omeren presented the details on how they look at stratification and what are different approaches and methodologies. So I will just go on to share my screen and I'll share my audio. Enlightening in a way that uh, Pim has very elaborately uh, summarized the field of stratification right from the beginning of where we started, uh, what has progressed, what are different methodological approaches, and what is the what are the strengths and limitations of different methodologies. And then uh, very accurately, Mark has brought in a policy and a practice perspective where he's highlighted that we need measures, valid measures, which should be biological, but also psychological, social, digital, which are valid, reliable, open access. And I think these are all, and the most important part, hypothesis driven. Uh, we, we really need those sorts of measures which are based on empirical grounds and can actually help us identify what is the right treatment for the right person at the right time. And this is exactly what is the crux of this funding call. And this is why actually we requested Pim and Mark to join hands with us to bring methodological expertise and the policy and practice perspective so that you could actually frame an application because this funding call is led by mental health translation team. So we have a translational focus. We would be looking into applications which can actually help us move uh, validation of markers for stratification in mental health along the development line. We emphasize that there needs to be robust pilot data to support your marker validation. There needs to be an empirical hypothesis that you need to define. Markers could be diagnostic, prognostic, predict predictive, mechanistic, uh, treatment response markers, and all the range of markers. But we, these are the most common attributes. And we have a 20 minutes uh, recorded webinar that uh, we are going to play now. 
and that will actually help you understand the whole call and we are very happy to respond to your individual questions so you can type them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll be typing the answers and we will also be responding to them live after this webinar. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Pim. And thank you, Lindsay. Over back to you, Lindsay, for the recorded part. So, I, ah, perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Program Manager at the Wellcome Trust within the Mental Health Team. I'd like to welcome you to our informational webinar on our Mental Health Award, finding the right treatment for the right people at the right time. In terms of today's agenda, we'll kick off with a round of introductions. This will be followed by Wellcome Health's strategy, we'll then move on to what do we mean by lived experience, then follow this by um, introducing the funding call, collaborating with people with lived experience in your research, and then we'll conclude with how to apply for this funding opportunity. So firstly, I would like to hand over to Margaret to introduce herself. Um, hi, my name is Margaret Tobiambo, lived experience advisor at this to Nairobi. Hi, I'm Catherine Smith, Project Officer in the Mental Health Organization team here at London. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Nakawanya, a lived experience advisor from Nairobi, Kenya. Hi, I'm Lindsay Bills, and I'm head of the Mental Health Translation team. Hi, uh, I'm Osman Hamdani. I'm research lead in the Mental Health Translation team. Hi, my name is Kate Martin. I'm head of lived experience in Welcome's Mental Health team. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, I would like to kick off with Welcome's Mental Health Strategy, and I'll pass over to Lindsay. Thanks, Chris. So the Welcome Strategy, um, we fund discovery research into life, health and well-being, and we also support research into solutions to three of the largest health challenges facing humanity, infectious disease, climate and health and mental health. And we promote diversity and inclusion and a positive research culture in all the work that we fund and we do. And then last year we announced that we have 16 billion to spend over the next 10 years in order to advance our strategy. If we then focus in, um, in more detail on the mental health vision and mission, our vision is a world in which no one is held back by mental health problems. And our mission is to drive a step change in early intervention and anxiety, depression and psychosis. And we acknowledge the challenges that are, exist around the diagnostic categories in mental health. And so we use the terms anxiety, depression and psychosis in a very broad sense. So it will include any anxiety or depressive disorder, including obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, and also all forms of psychotic disorder. So including uh, schizophrenia, postpartum psychosis and bipolar. So in order to achieve our vision and mission, we're looking to build a more integrated field of mental health science that combines different expertise, and this includes lived experience. We're going to fund a broad range of research to really advance understanding of how biological, psychological and social mechanisms interact and result in the development and the resolution of mental health conditions. And then we're also looking to drive the development of better ways to intervene early. Um, and this includes both um, improving our ability to group people, so to identify subgroups of people with different mental health conditions and or at risk of, of developing these conditions. And this will um, hopefully allow us to develop more targeted and personalised interventions. And then just on the right hand side, it shows some of the um, open opportunities on our website. So we've got two current contract opportunities open. Um, and then in addition to the call that you hear about very shortly, we also have another funding call that will open later this summer, uh, focusing on anxiety. So we can fund people in teams doing research across a number of levels, so from the subcellular through to the, to the social um, and across a wide range of disciplines that are re relevant to mental health. And this might include um, biologists, psychiatrists, chemists, um, economists, ethicists, um, historians. Um, and we can fund basic and clinical research for potential new and improved early mental health interventions. And these can be pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical, including digital and for use both in healthcare and non-healthcare settings. Um, if you are um, studying anxiety and depression, we ask that you use our currently agreed core measures in your research, unless there are exceptional reasons um, why this will not be possible. And this is in addition to other measures that you may wish to use. 
And then just to flag that while the mental health team focus on anxiety, depression and psychosis, we also have a discovery research team that accept applications on any other mental health condition, as well as anxiety, depression and psychosis. And they run three open funding schemes um, that run three times a year. And um, so it covers a number of different career stages as well. So please do have a look at our website for information on those. I'm now going to hand over to Margaret um, to talk about lived experience. Thank you. So um, lived experience, this is a unique form of knowledge, insight, expert, expertise that comes from having experiences of mental health challenges can either be um, diagnosed or not diagnosed. So in terms of lived experience is central to our work at Welcome and it helps in shaping the day to day work, thinking, direction and also decision making of the mental health team and projects or uh, that we develop or find uh, needs to have meaningful involvement of people with lived experience expertise and um, we also work to integrate lived experience expertise in the field of mental health science and i'll pass it to usman uh, thanks margaret uh, um, I'll, I'll, in the next few slides i'll walk you through the details of this funding call so this is a mental health award on finding the right treatment for the right people at the right time for anxiety and depression. As Lindsay in her strategy slides identified that we are focused on three conditions, anxiety, depression and psychosis. But for this mental health award, we are focused on only two conditions, anxiety and depression. Uh, before we go into the details of the call, uh, I would like to highlight a few aspects uh, related to the broader remit of this call, which is about whether we describe it as stratified psychiatry or prescient psychiatry or personalized mental health, all the stakeholders related to the field of mental health, including funders, clinicians, mental health scientists, and users, including people with lived experience of mental health problem, are becoming more concerned to ensure that the right people get the right treatment for the right, uh, get the right treatment at the right time for their mental health problems. How we can do that? We can do that by leveraging the progress made in recent decades in different scientific disciplines and apply them to validate objective markers in mental health in the same way as we have objective markers for risk, diagnosis, prognosis, prediction, and understanding mechanisms in other fields of health sciences, such as cardiology and oncology. We also understand that the field of mental health sciences is complex and multidimensional. They are not just biological, but also psychological and social determinants and that we need to apply robust methodologies, including advances in digital technologies to validate potential biological, psychological, social and digital markers that might inform meaningful identification of different subgroups of individuals with mental health problems. This is what is the aim of this call to support validation of biological, psychological, social or digital markers to enable stratification in anxiety or depression as early as possible. Now, there could be a different methods that can be used to measure the unique characteristics of the subgroups using different markers, and these could be biological such as genetics, biochemical imaging, clinical scores, or social such as sociodemographic characteristics, or behavioral uh, such as uh, psychological assessments. With the stratification that will allow us early targeted treatment and ensure that right, treatment, right people get the right treatment at the right time. Um, over to Margaret. Um, and in the context of this, of this call, we hope to prioritize um, engagement to people with lived experience of mental health problems to help in validating and um, for validating these markers for early, early identification and intervention of um, anxiety and depression, and as well as to make sure the research and its findings are applicable and also applicable to um, the end users. Um, back to you. Uh, thanks, Margaret. Uh, so why do we need stratification in mental health research? Uh, we know that current mental health categories are imperfect. They rely on subjective measures, resulting in significant heterogeneity of people within each diagnostic category, which in turn impacts the development and provision of effective early interventions. Stratified medicine aims to identify subgroup of individuals with a heterogeneous disease population based on their unique characteristics of subgroup such as underlying mechanism, risk factors, course of disease or treatment responses. As we discussed, there could be a number of different markers that could be utilized to measure unique characteristics of the subgroups, 
these are but not limited to biological markers psychological markers social markers and digital markers and we all know that there are a number of markers that are already reported in literature in terms of biological markers such as genetics biochemical imaging clinical scores or psychological assessments that can be used for stratification or social markers such as the sociodemographic characteristics environmental characteristics and so on and so forth and last but not the least digital markers and making use of the progress that has been made in the field of digital uh, science such as ecological momentary assessments gps tracking and so on and so forth so this is not a prescriptive list please work on the markers that you think you believe are the markers that can actually bring a change in mental health science field these are just meant to help you think about what are we asking for uh, what we expect is that the use of stratification methods will enable early identification and targeted treatment in mental health and we will be able to identify subgroups of individuals that will benefit most from a targeted pharmacological or a non-pharmacological treatment and that will enable early intervention with the potential to alter trajectories of these conditions and have maximum impact on people's life. We also believe that stratification can be used to improve understanding of disease pathophysiology, identify new targets for treatments, develop objective marker for disease risk, diagnosis, prognosis, response to treatments, and allow treatments to be developed, tested, and applied to the most appropriate patient groups. Um, with this, I'll hand over to Lindsay to describe the details of the scheme. Thanks, Susman. So at a glance, um, this scheme, in the scheme, projects should focus on early identification um, and targeted intervention in anxiety and depression. As we mentioned earlier, these are broadly defined and include OCD, PTSD and bipolar disorder. In terms of funding, um, we can fund academics and companies up to a total of £5 million and up to a duration of five years. However, if you need anything outside these limits, please do get in touch with us before you apply. There's no recommended amount um, or duration to apply for. We recommend that you apply for what you need and just be realistic. We can fund globally, except for mainland China and sanctioned territories. And if research is occurring in more than one location in the world, we ask that um, a co-applicant is based in each of the countries in which the research will be taking place. And we're also looking to encourage um, equitable partnerships between high, middle and low income countries as part of this call. We ask that the lead applicant has, a, has appropriate and necessary expertise in order to drive and lead a research programme um, that is being proposed, and we want evidence of this to be included in the application form. And then we are looking for applications from teams, ideally, um, and these can be multidisciplinary teams um, across diverse settings and across um, different career stages as well. So then what are we looking for? Um, just in a bit more detail, I'm not going to take you through all of these, um, but we are looking for applications that focus on the analytical or clinical validation of markers. Um, and they have to be of, for use in stratification for anxiety and depression. The markers, as Musman said earlier, they can be biological, psychological, social or digital, and they can be used either alone or in combination with observable or behavioural characteristics but they have to be able to enable stratification in anxiety and depression. And that might be according to risk and susceptibility or diagnosis or prognosis, prediction of treatment response or monitoring of disease progress. We are looking for proposals to embed lived experience expertise. And this is at multiple stages in the proposal. And um, so across planning, design and the delivery of the research. We're looking for markers that are scalable, ideally, um, and that can be applied in a number of different settings. Um, and really, ideally, through this call, would be tested in, in a number of different settings, as this will ensure generalizability of findings. Um, and then we also would like to consider the uptake of markers um, from the outset. Um, and there's some ideas around how you might do this um, on our website. So then this next slide uh, just shows the assessment criteria um, for the full applications. So for full applications, we'll review the application against four weighty criteria. The first is the research question, the proposed methodology and the potential for impact. And that's a 40% weighting. The second criteria is the suitability and the expertise of the team, 20% weighting. 
The third criteria is lived experience involvement, again, a 20% weighting. And the final criteria is around suitability of research location, research environment and research culture. And that's 20%. And that at the shortlisting stage, so when we're shortlisting preliminary applications, we will use a simplified rubric. And I'm now going to hand over to Veronica for more on lived experience. So all applications will need to demonstrate clear plans for collaboration and lived experience at multiple levels, which we'll discuss next. Um, it's particularly cru crucial to this call that we do that because that ensures that the findings and research will be meaningful and relevant to end users and reflect the priorities of people with lived experience. Lived experience experts um, should be paid appropriately for the work that they're doing. Um, we expect you to prove that you have budgeted and costed for collaboration and lived experience throughout your proposal. It's important that you remember that as a research community, we're all still learning about the best approaches to this kind of work. So we don't expect any sort of perfection at this stage. At Welcome, we're really interested in learning with other researchers and other organizations. And to that end, we'll be having uh, workshops with the lived experience team where we can share what we think are some of the best practices when it comes to this work. And I'll hand over to Kate. Brilliant, thank you. Um, to just say a bit more about what we're looking for in proposals and applications. So, as we said, we don't have a sort of a set um, uh, method or approach to collaborating with lived experience experts that we expect. Uh, the main thing is we really want this, the, the methods you're choosing to uh, collaborate with lived experience experts to be to be relevant and the most appropriate, the mo most influential for your particular uh, research and to really fit in with your research design. So, but what we are looking out for when we're reviewing applications are uh, that people with lived experience and um, lived experience experts are involved in multiple stages and in multiple levels of the uh, of the research. So um, looking at the governance, the oversight of the research, the planning, uh, the design, the delivery, the dissemination, etc. And what we know is that for each of those stages, you'll need to think about different methods, different models, different approaches to make sure that it's the most meaningful, the most impactful. So we're looking first off, are people involved in multiple stages? And then secondly, we're looking at uh, the range of roles that people might take on. So are the range of other roles appropriate for the for the kind of research that you're you're doing? So again, these are just a list of examples. This is not exhaustive. We don't expect all of these roles in every project, but just to give an example that some people might take on the role of expert advisors, some could be co-researchers, some may sit on advisory groups, etc. There may well be, of course, many of the roles that people can take on. But to summarise, we're looking at people to be involved in the most meaningful ways at multiple stages of the research and taking on multiple uh, different roles that are relevant to have the most uh, impact. Over to Catherine. Thanks, Kate. So um, just now a little bit of information about how to apply for this funding opportunity. Before you do apply and write your application, we strongly recommend that you consult the additional guidance on our website. We know it is quite detailed and lengthy, but I hope it will give you a good sense of what we're looking for in applications, as well as what is considered out of scope. So, for example, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, but do consult a website on this if you do not consider lived experience in your application or if you're focusing solely on things like implementation science or epidemiology, um, it may be considered out of scope. So please do check that. Um, section on the website if you are um, under any doubt. We also have additional information on our policies and guidance on involving people with lived experience, which you might find helpful. And want to highlight in particular some material in the useful document section. This is at the bottom of the web page. Um, things like the MRC framework for the development, um, design and analysis of stratified medicine research. So as I say, we do recommend you check the website for all of these resources and additional information on what we do um, and don't cover in the costs, etc. Next, we ask that you submit your preliminary application on Grant Tracker. Again, you can find this on the web page by 5 p.m. British summertime on Wednesday, the 7th of June 2023. Just to give you an overview of our timelines, after the submission of preliminary applications on the 7th of June, we will complete a shortlisting um, in July 2023. For those that are invited to submit a full application, the deadline will be 7th of September um, 2023 with interviews in November, um, which will take place online for shortlisted applicants. Um, just a little note on contacting us. You don't need to contact us before you write and submit your application. Um, if you do have a question on how to complete the application form, please contact our grants information advisors. 
And if you have broader questions about eligibility, what we offer or funding remit more broadly, please contact the mental health team at mentalhealth.welcome.org. Just a quick note that because we're seeking to be equitable in our response to potential applicants, we're unable to discuss the specific context um, content of applications, but please do find our email address if you have broader questions relating to the form or eligibility. And we also share information on LinkedIn and Twitter, so please do check us out there. And with that, um, I thank you all for listening and we look forward to receiving your applications and reading them in due course. Uh, thank you so much for listening to it. I hope uh, the context of the two talks. Osman, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, okay. Yeah, so you can hear me. Great. Let me just close the other window. Yeah, over to you, Leo. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Usman, for this section. I would like to invite Arthur, Wesley, and Usman to turn on their cameras. Um, this was certainly a delight to hear uh, what um, the foundations of NIH are doing, a uh, very biological approach. Very interesting, Arthur, what you are doing and to observe how uh, Brazil, uh, as an exemplar of a uh, middle-income country, is actually doing research on stratification and research that is, is top-notch, but that can also and it's also applicable to the reality of its own health system. So that is, is very interesting. And thank you, Usman, for sharing the, <clears throat> the recording, uh, the official recording of the, of the call. So we, it's now uh, in my time 11 away. We have 22 minutes to the end of the webinar. Why don't we spend at least 15 minutes doing um, uh, some uh, Q&A? So without further ado, the, I will read from the top. I uh, have a question for, for Arthur. This can be a brief answer from Alex Conway. The, the universal uh, in, interventions were not effective or they were low quality ev uh, evidence. Uh, there are two papers uh, interesting for you to read further. One of those is in BMJ, there's a, in 2012, there's a discussion. Uh, it's it's one trial uh, which, was a, uh, which failed and then there's a discussion in an editorial, which I think it's, interesting to read and there is um, Cochrane review I think it's 2016 in which they review the the evidence for this uh, um, school-based interventions and they uh, separate between universal strategies targeting everyone or high risk a group and uh, universal strategies were um, very marginal effects if you feel comfortable Arthur thank you for your answer if you could share the link to those papers in in, in in the chat box for the Q&A so that everyone can see what yeah, sure, if, can. Um, of course. Another question for, for you from another participant from Faraba too, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing names or last names, for you, Arthur, how predictable are these mental health, health illnesses, in your opinion? Um, I, I'm not sure I understood uh, the question precisely, but... Um... In the case of depression, um, uh, we there's a lot of ways in, in measure prediction, right? And how well your prediction is uh, good or, or not good. One of those is the area under the curve, which I presented. And we could, with this uh, 11 measures, have a good prediction. A good prediction is not an, a perfect or excellent prediction. It's um, considered a good prediction when you have it uh, between 0.7 and 0.8, being 0.5 in this measure is equal to chance, is flipping a coin. 1.0 would be a perfect prediction. We had 0 0.8, which is much better than chance, but not perfect. Um, but there's a lot of ways to measure predictions. There's calibration. It's a, a lot of different ways of measuring how well uh, you can predict uh, mental health outcomes. There are other uh, scores that I know for, for schizophrenia and other mental health outcomes. Uh, I developed for ADHD as well, the persistence of ADHD. So depends on, on the model and the, the disorder we are talking about. Great. And another question for you before I turn on to turn over to uh, Wesley and Usman. From Melanie, Melanie Abbas, uh, do you think the markers you found for the idea high risk group might link with predicting better or worse response to treatment? And if so, how? 
I think that's a very interesting uh, question. We didn't test that yet. Um, and, and I think I would guess uh, the obvious that uh, those that with a higher risk group would have a worse response to treatment, uh, but that's not, so, not necessarily true. And uh, we might look at that in, the, in some NIH funded trials that are available uh, for, with data available if uh, I don't know if they have the exact same uh, measures of risk but maybe they have so th this is an interesting uh, research question that could be pursued with existing data so I would be happy to try that thank you Arthur um, Usman um, questions for you uh, from Shahi Wells um, there's a question is it an expectation that we do a multi-country study? And there is a similar question uh, from Kravat uh, Kondancha. Can an early career clinician researcher apply to establish our research group in international collaboration? Uh, thanks for your questions. Um, we do not require a study to be multi-country, but we do require that the markers that you select have a translational potential. We do promote collaborations between high-income countries and low-middle-income countries. And obviously, the study design and settings that you choose uh, should be suited to your research question. Uh, definitely, this is one of the criteria that we are looking at, that the markers should have a translational potential in low-resource settings as well. So that's that's what we have to say about it. In terms of uh, an early career researcher to be applying to this funding call to establish a research group, our focus is on supporting research that will uh, focus on validation of markers, how that supports you, how do you use that to build your network, collaborators, partners. I think that is entirely up to you. You can put it in the plans in terms of the translational potential and the sustainability plans, but uh, that's not something that uh, the intent of the call is, but obviously you can use the resources and the opportunity to establish yourself in the area. Thank you, Usman. There is another question. Um, if these call is for clinical research only, um, so we do need uh, by we do need a robust pilot data to support stratification and because this is the translational nature of the call so we are not focused on the basic science research but it is uh, translational research that we are really focused on so definitely the focus is on translational research rather than the basic research okay thank you so much um does this funding call include the use of a mechanistic biomarker to test the efficacy of the therapy targeting the mechanism? I can't comment on the very specific details, but yes, validation of mechanistic markers is within the scope of the call. Is there an option to submit letters of support with the preliminary application? Yes. Uh, so there's a, once you go on to the grant, grant tracker, uh, you can fill in the application and then there are other support forms that you can upload things in there that you think are relevant. For example, your proof of concept data, your letters of support, your prior uh, data that's not published that you're using to build the hypothesis or support the hypothesis. So yes, once you go on to the grant tracker, you'll find the place where you can upload additional information, which doesn't go into the specific sections that we have for the application. Um, could you? I'm going, this is kind of a longer question. I'm going to read it. Could you please quickly summarize what is required for the preliminary stage in terms of co applicant and financial estimation? For example, it is said, quotes, the lead applicant is responsible for inviting all other participants to participate in their application, end of quotes, and that I am supposed to invite them through the system to ask them to log on, fill some information, and confirm their participation. So far, I have not found how to do so. Uh, so you can go on to the grant tracker and you can start to fill in the preliminary application. It's very straightforward and it's really small. They're just four pages. You can, you'll have to put in the names of the partners and collaborators. And if you have any questions or you feel any difficulty, please feel free to write to the email address that's given and we'll be more than happy to respond to any specific queries or troubles that you may have. This is a two-part question, or actually two questions within one. Uh, I would like to ask if the funding opportunity can be for women sick, depressed during pregnancy by using the score of EPDS, first part, and do we need to cooperate with researchers from the UK? 
Um, so as uh, we said in the webinar, uh, we are open to fund any research across the globe except mainland China and sanctioned territories. So yes, uh, the application can come from anywhere and you can definitely focus on validation of markers uh, in postnatally depressed women. So that's a, a target population because that is within the depression category. So yes. Does Welcome Trust have examples of preview, previous grants? I, I, I get, it's written previous grants that won. I would imagine previous awarded grants that can serve as an editor. Uh, so we do not have uh, such uh, examples online available, but maybe the two talks that uh, Wesley and Arthur gave, so they can give you the idea of the scope of the project. You can also go on our website and look at this full webinar. I just played the part specific to the funding call. If you go and play the full webinar, Professor Pim Kaifers has actually cited many papers uh, which are very relevant to this funding call. And he has really laid down some really important uh, kind of uh, information there, which might help you put together the application. So we do not have a sample completed application for the funding call, but you can benefit from these webinars and the information that's available. Please also look at the MRC certification guidance, which is there on the web page as well. That does cite some projects and you can also find many other projects similarly, which are which are ongoing and are related to stratification in mental health research. And I'm sure you'll find them helpful in thinking through the uh, details of this call. And we can find the, the webinar that you presented in WHO and Dr. Cooper following the link that you provided to us at the beginning of the, of the webinar. Is that yes, so that's the funding page link. And on the funding page, you can find the link to the webinars and support documents and everything in there. The study population, another question for you, are we supposed to have only uh, most vulnerable groups or along the lifespan development? Lifespan are so our focus is on early intervention and the early definition of early intervention will vary depending upon the condition the context and the settings so you can suit yourself according to uh, the study population you're looking at the country that you're looking at and the study condition that you are focused on but it has to be an early intervention and that needs to be clearly articulated that how this is an early intervention Wesley, a question for you. Um, is uh, the foundation of NIH accepting applications and applicants coming from low and middle income countries? Yeah, we, we do on a case by case basis have discussions on what could be possible for collaborations within our consortium. So i um, happy to have any discussions. So feel free to reach out to me if you would like to propose maybe collaborating in a space. It may map onto an existing initiative, it might be something new. Uh, Usman, there was a question about, um, oh, can you confirm that small businesses are eligible to apply to the, this call? Um, so if you go on our website and look at the grant conditions, any organization that is willing to or can sign up to our grant conditions is eligible to apply. So just look at our grant conditions and if you think your organization can sign up to them, uh, yes, um, you can then apply. Question for Wesley. Um, could, or potentially Usman and potentially for, for, the, for any of you actually, could you give more examples of what is meant by a digital marker? Uh, the, I guess I can, I can jump in there. Um, you know, there are already digital markers that are used explicitly, you know, heart rate uh, that are used more, more widely. I think what's more interesting is remote digital monitoring than just digital. So the ability to be remotely uh, capturing information from someone's day to day that wouldn't be able to capture um, if you were having to have them come in on a monthly basis. Um, so those are the innovative aspects, I think, of, of digital uh, measurements that I think we're most interested in. So remote monitoring and Usman, I, um, and you probably have lots directly related to what your your specific call is here. Um, so there can be many digital markers as you have identified, but there could be also uh, ecological momentary assessments that being used to predict like, uh, for example, a lot of data is collected and then that can help you predict when uh, someone is going to have a, a remission or a response or a relapse of an illness. And uh, similarly, Remote sensing, as you have said, can be used for a number of things. GPS tracking can help uh, you look at the activity. Uh, and similarly, the gadgets, use of gadgets, interactions. Similarly, speech, uh, natural language processing, speech markers. Uh, they are, there's a lot of research that's going on on speech markers for stratification. Uh, so 
So the list is quite exhaustive. And if you just like maybe look into the PubMed, uh, you'll find many, many good papers which are on, on the subject. Thank you. Um... Usman, would you consider? Thanks for sharing the, the link again of uh, to the to the webinar that you presented earlier um, for everyone. The link is now in in uh, the chat box. Uh, Usman, would you consider patient? I'm sorry, would you consider involvement of clinicians working directly with patients a quote lived experience component? So clinicians working with uh, patients with mental health problems do not constitute lived experience involvement. Lived experience involvement means people who had the experience of mental health symptoms firsthand, or they could be like carers, for example, uh, a sibling, a parent, a child, or people who have actually had the experience of managing the mental health problems themselves or as part of their family or a social network. So the clinicians won't constitute lived experience at, um, involvement in mental health research as part of this call. Thank you, Usman. Arthur, question for you. Uh, what have been the most challenging aspects of doing research in a stratification in a middle income country? And what have been the most rewarding aspects of doing such research in a middle income country? Um, well, th there's one thing that um, um, we think we are we're very thankful for to NIH and Wellcome Trust because, as you might know, there have been some discussions about that in science and nature that we had um, politically very hard times in Brazil in terms of national funding. We began with a national funding that uh, that seemed disappeared uh, after some some time. So. We were very lucky uh, to have uh, been funded by uh, external institutions. So I think one problem is funding. Um, the other problem is learning that uh, may, much of the data that, of course, you always want to learn about what people have done in the past in terms of risk factors and uh, and analysis in our in our previous uh, uh, efforts and. We learned that uh, we should begin at some point, we, we should begin from scratch because some things do not translate to our settings. Uh, for instance, being an ethnic minority or not is very different in the UK, India, Nepal, and in Brazil. So I think one of the things is that we, 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 I don't know, we kind of, we were more lost in translation in, in these terms in, uh, in middle income countries because we, you know, it's, it's a whole new thing in some, uh, in some ways. And the most rewarding thing is, is, is learning that we can do, uh, you know, competitive uh, research and, and, and meaningful research that translates to the other side. So it's, it's very interesting for us to have developed develop something here that is that can be used in the United States or in the UK, uh, of course, with adaptations. And uh, I think for us, it's a double reward when we do that. So uh, I think that's it. I appreciate your your, your answers. Uh, certainly, it is challenging, but you know it is uh, it is an, you know an open canvas full of opportunities, and uh, and definitely. You know, within a country, high income regions can learn from low income regions, and in the world, higher income countries can learn from, you know, middle and, and low income countries. The, the knowledge and learning uh, goes in so many directions uh, if we keep our mind open, of course. Um, Wesley, a question for you How do you envision that this science can transform mental health? I think it's important to realize that um, that there are that there are new paradigms that need to be created with that are centered on patients and the things that are meaningful to them. We have measurements that can detect the later stages and that, but the sensitivity and the ability to detect the earliest stages and move uh, therapeutics uh, and solutions to patients, giving them options. Just the paradigm hasn't changed yet. 
Uh, and we really do need to find those solutions that can get to the earliest stages and monitor those earliest progressions. So the ability to, to find those measurements, to validate those in a way that is trusted by the community and trusted by regulators and by industry, I think we will find a solutions, find that those solutions will enable a paradigm change for therapeutic interventions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Wesley, so much. Usman, over to you before we begin to close this this webinar. Any any additional thoughts or any closing remarks from Welcome Trust? Uh, no, I think uh, we have tried our best uh, to elaborate on uh, the different aspects of stratification through these webinars with experts. Uh, please uh, have a look at the scheme page. I have shared the link in response to some questions. Um, have a look at the webinar that's there. Have a look at the support documents that we have made available so that you can understand the scope of the call. Please do look at the eligibility criteria and the assessment criteria. It's important that you have some pilot data and your marker that you select is hypothesis driven and there is an empirical basis of what you're selecting and proposing to validate. Uh, uh, we have provided email links. You can write to us. You can seek clarifications or questions that you may have. And last but not the least, uh, NIMH uh, is hosting the Global Mental Health Conference. And there is a track on stratification in mental health. And the website is live. So over to Leo to about uh, the NIMH Global Mental Health Conference and uh, the abstract submission that's there. So that's still another opportunity to be part of this effort to promote stratification in global mental health. I would like to thank Arthur and Wesley and Leo for your time and to all the participants for the very engaging discussion and for listening to all the talks and uh, participating. Thank you. Thank you, Usman. The Global Mental Health Conference will take place between October 30th and November 1st of 2023. The website is www.gmhconference.com. As Usman mentioned, registrations are uh, open and so are a submission of abstracts for you know, panels, presentations, and, and, and the posters as well. Um, our next webinar will be in September, and not September, September, sorry, in July 26th, we will have uh, NIMH's Office of Clinical Research walking us through important elements of clinical trials uh, that are considered uh, uh, important for uh, applications submitted to NIMH. We will provide more details of this uh, uh, July 26th uh, webinar. And as I said at the beginning, uh, towards September of this year, we will have a similar webinar on physician psychiatry or certification. Uh, and, and the panelists will be our colleagues uh, from NIMH. So thank you all for your time. I we, on behalf of uh, Welcome Trust and uh, the NIMH team and the people that are, are working behind the scenes to put together this webinar series. Thank you so much for your time and we wish you a great rest of your day wherever you guys are. This webinar will be uploaded entirely in the coming days. Thank you so much.